And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer into the temple, a, a writer and game designer with a background in cultural psychology, now venturing into the into the wonderful world of insane game development with Bard RPG. I keep wanting to put a the in that. The <laughs> one and only Scriv the Bard. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing fantastic. Thank you very much. What an opening. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Love it. I get the feeling one of these days somebody's going to get the wrong idea for my opening. I'm going to get sued by the Buffer family or something. Oh, no. <laughs> But until then, own uh, it. <laughs> um, actually, actually, if worse comes to worse, I'll just say, I'm a, I'm a parody. I'm a parody. You guys can't do shit. Mm. <laughs> oh, because in that kind of situation, I would be technically correct, the best kind of correct. <laughs> so, I usually start these off with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Okay. So. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games as a whole, and what made it stick. Ooh, okay. It was a dark and stormy night, which is not an exaggeration, actually. My very first, um, we'll, we'll say D&D, &D, my very first D&D &D game, because that was the system that I was introduced to by a friend and co-worker, <laughs> was a Halloween-themed one-shot, and it was indeed a dark and stormy night. Um, I had been, this, this story will be familiar for a lot of people. I'd been wanting to play TTRPGs for so long. I, I am a huge book nerd. I enjoyed writing. I enjoyed video games and I hadn't quite, uh, ventured into the realm of D and D and Pathfinder and, and other systems. Uh, for a while because I just did not know enough people who were playing those games or who were open about playing those games. And I was a theater ne nerd too in, in school, so you'd think I would have found some other ones, um, but I, I didn't actually play my first game uh, with a crew, with the DM, until, ooh, let's see, about 2013. 2014, actually. Yeah. And I'm going to take a stab in the dark that it was f that it was 5e. Yes, it was. That was the system. Those were the books that my friend had. Uh, it wasn't until later on that I started learning and reading and experiencing other other um, editions as well. But it was it was so much fun. We had a fantastic time. Of course, the beer and the food and the shenanigans were were a plenty, but it was a very good experience. Um, we continued on with that crew for a few more sessions, then another reoccurring theme that we can all relate to. It eventually fell apart, unfortunately. People move, life happens, and I decided, you know what, I'm tired of waiting. I would like to GM myself. So got the books, started writing up some adventures, started new campaigns, and just continued on from there. So it wasn't too long after that. Uh, well, okay, let's say it was a, let's see, about two years mm -hmm. after that, that I took it a step further from doing uh, campaigns, from doing homebrew, from doing Adventurers League at the friendly local game store to once I then moved to a new town, um, started doing intro D&D &D sessions and family-friendly campaigns at a new bookstore. Mm -hmm. uh, made some friends in the local area. Everyone's a tabletop gaming nerd. They said, hey, we're looking for some people to help with our game day and for the launch of some family-friendly uh, events. So I volunteered, put some games together. The kids had so much fun. 
Uh, it, it was it was a combination of like kids knowing about D and D and knowing about this style of gameplay and wanting to get involved, and the parents being completely clueless. Or conversely, parents who had grown up with uh, advanced Dungeons and Dragons and were excited about the new additions and wanted to get their kids into it. Mm-hmm. So what what started off as intro games for the families then became D&D storytelling workshops uh, because I do have a soft spot for storytelling. I do love working with kids and saw an opportunity there in using the TTRPG uh, vehicle to teach kids about storytelling to help them grow in confidence and communication and all of that. And it just it just continued on. Mm-hmm. And uh, now here I am today. Yeah. <laughs> And um, with some of the people who grew, who grew up playing and, and were looking at the new edition, I wonder I wonder with some of them if you if um you would en- if they would end up having nom flashbacks if you bring up Tomb of Horrors. <laughs> <laughs> we did have some Tomb of Horror conversations, <laughs> absolutely. Oh. Uh, but I think overall, because of the environment, they enjoyed. I have my own opinions of the design approach of fifth edition but they enjoyed that it was more accessible for the younger gamers as yeah. well so we we truly did have that multi-generational uh gaming table for those events which was which was really cool actually yeah i've enjoyed some of that myself but i but um i will i will not deny that i have pi- that i have picked on um on some on some aspects of the de- some aspects of the design that I find questionable because uh huh well the joke that I often make around here is we we hold these truths to be self evident that all are cremated equal oh no <laughs> which is a fancy way yeah, of saying everybody on. everybody gets the roast <laughs> yeah no, the, nobody gets it nobody gets any special treatment one mm-hmm. one way one way or the other because. Let's not forget the dice gods are a model of equality. It does not matter mm. your your age, race, ge- gender identification, whatever. The dice gods hate you. Oh, and I had horrible luck with dice as well. Uh, as as a player, <laughs> I I I could never catch a break. Um, the dice rolls, oh, the dice only landed in my favor when I started. GMing more, mm-hmm. which maybe that's part of why I became addicted, and and ended up in a forever GM kind of state. I hadn't actually thought about that before. A gag that I have cons- uh, that I have considered doing. I just need to find the right the right voice for it because I can't do it. Is some some parody of those uh, of of those of those sad com- of those sad commercials I saw growing up, and just rephrasing it as a forever GM support group. You know, for for, for, just five cent, oh. for just five cents a day, for just five cents a day, you can help find a forever G. You can help find a home for these forever GMs or something. <laughs> okay, if you need like an actor testimonial, I will <laughs> gladly contribute to this. Yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how, how I'm going to I'm going to script it. Um, but <laughs> that that's been an idea that's been oh. in the back of that's been in the back of my head for the longest time. Um, Just get I'm, some Sarah McLaughlin in the background, and you're good. That, yeah, that's the, that's the plan. Um, I, it's definitely not going to be monetizable, but this isn't to. But this isn't something I would monetize anyways. It's there solely to take the piss. Parody, parody. Um, you can get away with a lot in the name of comedy. <laughs> and I, um, I'm always reminded of a of something that Mel Brooks once said about comedy in general and dark comedy specifically. Mm-hmm. Tragedy is when I cut my finger. Comedy mm-hmm. is when you fall into an open sewer hole and die. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> oh. The point he was trying to get at is that it's always funny when it happens to somebody else. Mm-hmm. Oh. Now, given given that background, I'm, did were you were you mostly a one system lifer when it came to? D and D, or over the years, did you experiment with other systems? Absolutely, experimented with other systems, dude. I'm I'm releasing my own. <laughs> <laughs> I got so uh, it got to the point where I 
had to homebrew and change so much about fifth edition. And, you know, there there is a time and a place for fifth edition. Absolutely. And it was my introduction mm -hmm. to game design. Uh, it, it's what first got me really thinking about game theory, thinking about design goals and all of those different things. And it, it was very, very fun to pick apart as well when I was experimenting and then comparing and contrasting different elements of D&D to, um, so if, if you like horror, Dread is, is one of my favorite games. It's one of the smoothest design approaches I've ever seen in that it really just has one mechanic with the uh, with the Jenga tower. Um, I don't know if you've played it before, but I if have. you like horror, and oh my god, I love it so and, much. Um, on one on one hand, it's a on one hand, it's a it's a brilliant move to use a Jenga tower to create tension. Mm -hmm. But on the on the other hand, to the to whoever decided to use a Jenga tower as as the, as that mechanic, as somebody who's put who's put up with. Who's put up with one too many games of Jenga? Fuck you. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> like I said, a time and a place. Yeah. Time and a place. And it, it depends on what you want out of the game, yeah. oh, too. Oh, and, yeah. and this is part of why, with the the friends that I had been making and the kind of stories and the style of storytelling that began to unfold, we branched away from fifth edition. Uh, because if if you want you know, so D and D is a monster hunting sim. You do the exploration, but it's it's predominantly focused on combat. We can talk about pillars of play and and all of that kind of thing. And if you want to do monster hunting, then yeah, go for it. Whatever whatever edition you want to do, do D and D, do Pathfinder. Uh, I have a lot of fun with Warhammer 40k. If you want something that's combat centric, then do it. It got to the point, however, with the kids and the family campaigns and the, the streamed actual plays that, that my friends and I do a few times a month, uh, when we can, when life permits and schedules align, um, it got to the point where we liked the combat, that was fun and exciting, but it did those systems didn't really leave a lot of opportunity for the social aspect, for narrative driven kind of experiences and you had to change so much so we ended up moving away from dnd i ended up pulling inspiration from dread from um dungeon world i even have my burning wheel book behind me which which i crack open and leaf through although that is crunchy as heck um lady blackbird is another one that i ended up looking at for inspiration i've, I've got a whole shelf of different games back there. Best if Left you, Buried. If you want Crunch, I could always introduce you to Phoenix Command. Phoenix Command. Okay, so I have not I have not touched Phoenix Command yet. But um, that's that's something that I for this purpose, mm -hmm. for Bard RPG, that's actually something that I was starting to step away from. Because while I do love a good crunchy system and I do love engaging and dynamic combat mechanics, that is not actually the focus of Bard RPG. And that's not the focus for the audience that I am writing for. Yeah. Um and I that's definitely some that's definitely something that I saw and if you don't mind me taking a stab at the in the dark when it came to your home brewing days with 5th edition. One of them invo one of them involved trying to fix the ranger, didn't it? <laughs> Fixing everything, man. <laughs> yes, ra ranger um actually warlock uh, sorcerer. Yeah, just so, so you didn't have to deal at the. I can understand that, given how um, elsewhere on the channel we have we have talked about the issue of up until fifth edition we called it Codzilla, and fifth edition we call it Cowzilla. Okay. Oh, um, Cod's the Cod and Codzilla is short for cleric or druid. Ah, because got it. In the past, especially in third edition and and in Pathfinder, mm -hmm. the playing a cleric or druid who knows what they're doing is an entire party into themselves and basically basically bends the game over backwards harder yeah. than any player character in Mage. Mm. Very OP'd. Yeah. yeah. Um. 
which is which is why I always laugh when when pe when people try when people try and tell me that that um that casters are perfectly balanced to that to Oh that no, I, they're not. To that they're I They're absolutely to, not. To the, and to that I to that I say you're probably the same motherfuckers who said Heroes of Might and Magic 2 was perfectly balanced with no exploits. You know, because <laughs> the people not... who will say it's perfectly balanced are the ones who are benefiting from the imbalances. Yeah, and Heroes of Might and Magic 2 I get I give a lot of crap for because of how Getting a once you get a stack of once you get a stack of genies, the game is stupid easy. Mm, <laughs> um, yeah. But the the ranger the ranger has been has been has been the whip has has been the whipping boy for the longest time, um, largely because it's kind of hard to do an outdoorsy archetype when the game is dungeons and dragons. Right. But. I could see I could see that frustration, and he, I even predicted that people would do total overhauls of fifth edition with time. And you see it so much. So within the past uh, handful of years, how many indie designers and writers have cropped up, like like just daisies, like dandelions, you know? Because you there want the are short so many the long holes. <laughs> the short answer, probably, but there are so many holes within the system and, and so many imbalances. And I think that uh, Watsi, the fact that they have DMs Guild, the fact that they outsource so much of their writing and designing now so they can avoid, you know, actually hiring people. <laughs> what? Um, it, it's, it's kind of, it gets old. Um, it, gets, it gets very old very quickly and it becomes a very shall we say exploitative world for indie designers i think yeah i've um i've jo i've joke i've um jokingly made an analogy between that and um the and the prop and the problems that ha that happen with so with every every bethesda game <laughs> yes <laughs> and i know i know that they like to claim that they're you that the creation engine isn't the case, but it's it's um it's just it's just a revamped version of game of Gamebryo, which was not which was which could barely handle seventh generation systems, and mm. the and um they tr they've tried to argue that the bugs are part of the charm, which is as 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 um I meant to do that of an of an argument as you can make, <laughs> yeah. but. Because, but because of the fact that there are so many mods trying to trying to fix the issue, um, I think I think they're I think they they have they can have a mindset of everything being fine. Oh yeah, and they're going to continue to harvest. Mm -hmm. DM skill. They're going to continue to harvest and feed into unearthed unearthed arcana and get free work. Oh. And oh, maybe one day there will be a sixth edition. But for now, there's. There's no incentive to I think, do so. I um I think I think a sixth edition is going to happen, and when it does, it's going to start a civil war. It'll happen once people get tired of uh, creating free content for Watsi. Oh. Uh, plus, well, for me, there's no skin off my back because I because I've already found, um, I've I've already found promising alternatives. I thought level mm -hmm. I thought level up was going to be the was going to be the overhaul I had asked for, but um, it wasn't. Uh, but that's a whole other story. Mm. Now, given given that given that design, and since you're using a D6 system, mm -hmm. um, just out of curiosity, I'd like to I'd like to name a couple um, RPG, RPGs and and whether or not you whether or not you are familiar with them or if they served as an influence at all. Okay. Um, one of them is West End is the West End D6 line. Um, West End D6 line. Wh which one? Um, their mo their biggest claim to fame is be is being the first Star Wars RPG. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, there was also Ghostbusters, um, in both in a frightfully cheerful game and Ghostbusters International. The latter one is the better. Better, better received one, um, and a tri a trinity of projects, 
called D6 Adventure, D6 Space, and D6 Fantasy that came out in 2004. Uh, along along with a along with a handful of of other projects, but that that was one. The other one, which is technically a D6 system, but not quite. Um, year Zero. So I will say, I have not played any of those systems. I know of them. Mm -hmm. I have read into them. But I started to... So for me, the system itself and, and the design goal for Bard RPG wasn't just using the D6s. I, obviously, dice being the decision resolution aspect of, of the design, but looking at, through the design, what kind of style of play am I trying to encourage? Mm -hmm. And how does character building, how uh, does, does action um, resolution feed into that? Yeah. Because initially, in an early, early form of Bard RPG, I was looking at D10s. And I wanted to look at percentages and look at odds and probability. And at a certain point, I realized, you know what, if I want this to be accessible for young gamers, as well as enjoyable by uh, people who've been playing TTRPGs for a while, then that's maybe I shouldn't get into that level of math. Because I've had gamers as young as five around the table before. And I want this to be something easy to pick up, easy to learn, that you're not going to have to have a lot of reference for. Yeah. Like to flip back and forth. And that's a smart move since... An easy trap to fall into is scope creep. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So that's that's why I advise picking your two or three design goals at the beginning. And the way, the, the analogy I like to use, it's actually an analogy in my academic pursuits that a professor used uh, when describing writing like a, a dissertation. Anytime you have a long running bit of research or a long running project like designing a game you pick those goals and those goals help you navigate down a long hallway and at the end of that hallway there's a door and it's open and there's light shining through it and it's beautiful that represents your finished product your finished project paper whatever it may be but all along that hallway you have all these other doors on either side of you there could be interesting sounds coming out of them there could be nice lights shining through the cracks in those doors as well. Some of them may be flung wide open as you walk past. And each one of those doors represents the danger of scope, uh, scope creep. Mm -hmm. And if you look through that door, no matter how good it looks, sounds, or smells, if it does not support that core design goal that you have set for yourself, you have to close it, you have to keep walking. Take some of it, leave others behind, and it is so challenging especially if you do love a lot of different systems and if you like a lot of different dynamic types of play and there there are different systems for different play styles and it's very difficult to try to make something that does it all because then when you try to make a multi-tool of a game system you're going to end up doing a lot of different things eh, in an okay way but nothing really really well yeah, and um, I've got I've I've gotten myself in a bit in a bit of trouble because I, because I've picked on um, I picked on I picked on apo on um, not apologist but big ad but big adherence for this idea of GURPS or any other game is the o is the only game that you need. Um, you picked on GURPS? Oh no! <laughs> I can imagine the backlash. <laughs> um. Well, because well, the thing is, then then some people get butt hurt about that, and I and I do it even more because now now it's just at a point where I find it funny. Yeah. <laughs> but and it and it's not like it's not like I pick on GURPS exclusively. Um, of course. My big my big whipping boy has always been Rifts, actually. Oh, okay. Oh. And and what what do you say against Rifts? That I should that I should not need thirty pages of house rules to run your damn game. <laughs> house ruling is a spice, not the main dish. Yes. Also, um. Absolutely. Also, who who whoever whoever decide 
I've I've jokingly said that anybody who builds a game without an in, without an index or without a proper table of contents mm -hmm. should should be put on the stock so everyone can throw tomatoes at them or should you be need a table of contents. You need uh, contents. You need that so much. It, it doesn't matter how how lengthy the game guidebook is or how short. Like Bard RPG. Well, depending on stretch goals, fingers crossed, those are looking all right. Um, it's going to be less than 100 pages. Probably around that 70 to 80 mark. If I were to look at the core system itself, without the artwork, without the examples and the scenarios and sample story maps and all of that, the system itself can be captured in less than 20 pages. But I'm still going to have a table of contents because that, that just helps for the usability of the book as well. That's yeah. that's just simple presentation and layout. Oh. Nav I studied navigation in college and specifically web not navigation but um web usability. And mm, some of the navigation nice. rules that I that I learned I tr I try and apply whenever I whenever I cover games and mm -hmm. Proper navigation is the thing that will always get me blood boiling furious, because um, I, in the and that's the reason that's one of the, aside from the, how broken the how busted the game is, unless we're talking about the Savage Worlds version, that's the reason why all of Palladium's output I repeat I repeatedly pick on, because mm -hmm. the t first off the table of contents is filled with lies, and second off they don't have an index. Filled with lies. Does it not actually match the content? Yes. Oh no. This is because this is because apparently apparently Simbeta had that has this habit of making changes at the last minute. Mm. It's also the That's reason for for the for the infamous formatting that people that has been the butt of jokes for as long as I've been doing this. Mm. Um, but. Of course, of course, the, that problem's kind of kind of ended up solving himself, so, solving itself because he, he's kind of he's kind of bound he's kind of bound out from active development after that little incident where he ended up pissing off the entire Robotech fan base. Time to retire, right? Time to take a step down. <laughs> he did. He did some. He did something really stupid with the um, minis manufacturer he was working with, and, man mm -hmm. and managed to get everybody pissed at him. What did he do? Um, uh, this was for. I will try and give the cliff notes. This yeah, was for yeah. Robotech Tactics, which was the mm -hmm. first Robotech related related project that had that had been that had come out in decades. And what end? What end? It was supposed to be a a Robotech themed skirmish miniatures game. The most yep, tactical tactical miniatures game. Yeah. The most idiot proof setup you can do, right? Mm hmm Well as I learned as I learned in insurance, the universe will always make a bigger idiot. <laughs> For he he partnered up with Ninja Division to ha to handle the handle the construction of the of the minis and had the whole thing kickstarted for two waves. The first wave, the first wave came out all right. Then in the then midway through the second wave, apparently he he wanted he wanted more articulation with the minis. Is the story that I had heard. Take that with a grain. Take this with a grain of salt. Okay. Um, articulation on minis. You don't need you don't need to be an expert on mini on war gaming to know why that's a terrible idea. Yeah. That's one thing I heard. The other was that he wanted them built like model airplanes. No idea what? why you'd want that. For okay, all right. The whole thing go. The whole thing went south. He tried to claim that Ninja Division, um, had put had put out substandard material, so he had to cancel Wave Two. And keep in oh, mind, no. people had pe people had backed with the expectation of two waves. Right. And this made a lot of money on Kickstarter. And of course, there weren't refunds, were there? No, and he he tried oh, he tried no. to, and when he and when um he tried to claim he tried to throw all the blame on Ninja Division. Ninja Division came out and was like, "Yeah, this guy's full of shit." Oh, and, as they rightly should. And the last I had heard, 
the last that I had heard from him, or or about him, I've never I've never spoken with the guy. Um, he had tr he had tried to he was going to make an appearance at a at a at a convention in um in in some some place in Oregon, and some people mm. wrote to, some people wrote to the convention, and he was disinvited. <laughs> because he's lost that trust and and any shred of perceived professionalism when you when you fuck up that badly <laughs> that's how how would he in any way consider that he would still have a positive reception after something like that because that's that's not only a breach of trust and in some cases downright theft of funds uh for the backers, you're not upholding your end of that that contract that you enter into, and then to try to throw shade on the the um, the company, mm -hmm. to try to th throw shade on the company actually developing the miniatures. And, and okay, okay, I'm I'm still also getting caught up on this idea of articulation in minis. You're making action figures. <laughs> is that was that what oh, it was meant the, to be? These are the standard thirty millimeter uh, minis. Yeah, I, I I'm looking at some that I've got, um, and I'm just trying to understand. Like, get some poly pockets or something, bro. Like, that's not gonna work. <laughs> I know I know some toy collectors who if they who if they heard about that that idea of articulation with the, with those kind of minis, it's like first off, even micro machines wasn't that small. <laughs> Sec second off, um, I am not drunk enough to try to try and do an imitation of the micro machines voice, because <laughs> I because I don't feel like biting my tongue off or something. Not with that attitude. <laughs> micro machines. Oh my god. Uh, but move. But moving. But be and the, and uh, when I found out that. Riffs get Riffs was getting the Savage Worlds treatment. I ended up bust. Mm -hmm. I ended up legitimately busting out laughing, because mm -hmm. this is a guy who would get so happy if anybody tried to do system conversions with his system. <laughs> uh, like he he would get really mad if somebody tried to do say a D twenty modern conversion of Rifts. Mm -hmm. People still people still did it anyways. I could find I could find them all over the place. Uh, yeah, how are you really gonna stop no, him from doing you that? Can, you can't. That's the neat part, you know. Yeah. Um, but now one one thing that I did find I did kind of, I did find kind of interesting is the system of archetype and sub archetype that you're go yes. that you're going with. Because um, I'm because I always I always find that sort of type subtype approach to be a far to be a far interesting a far more interesting ap approach to class design because there's a lot more you can do with it. It's the reason I have yes. a soft spot for. For um, the my character is an adjective noun who verbs thing that the cipher system does. Yes, yes. Oh, that's a fantastic example. Thinking about what you do and your motivations for doing them. Mm -hmm. I I knew that I didn't I didn't want class systems as much. Well, first of all, because one of the design goals was to be genre agnostic, and it's really hard to have your conventional TTRPG classes. Because we were talking about ranger earlier, ranger, warlock, cleric, druid. It's hard to have those types of character building options presented without coding it for a certain genre like fantasy. So I wanted to pull from those Jungian archetypes, which come from psychological and literary um, theories. This is one of the most obvious ways in which I, I pull from the psychology aspect of it. And Jungian archetypes are described, at, or they can be, described as these kind of timeless characterizations that people see in our stories that are passed down through generations. So we see it in folklore and mythology and the types of stories we tell and that also end up resonating within within us, within each other. Um, and that's, it's, it's that kind of core connection that we form with these different type of archetypes. There are 12 Jungian archetypes, and I've adapted those into six ability sub-archetypes and six will sub-archetypes. 
And because we have those connections to these general um, characterizations, these personas, that's the theory is that's part of why they continue to reoccur through stories, regardless of what genre, what setting that story may reside in. So that's something I really wanted to dig into for this one. And uh, splitting it into will sub archetypes and ability sub archetypes, the hope is that it will help to emphasize that idea of mindful action. So often in life, we tend to act first and think about the why later on. And because I wanted to look at mindful action, because I wanted to look at reflection and collaborative storytelling, I wanted to emphasize determining your will and the motivation, the why behind your character first, before you get to, okay, now how do you act upon that motivation? Um, you know, having a, a type, an approach to character backstory without it necessarily being a backstory, but that actually had some sort of benefit mm -hmm. <laughs> to using D&D. &D. Yeah. Um, well, so, oh, go it's, ahead. It's funny you, it's fun, it's funny you bring, there's t two thing, two things that I, I couldn't help but observe. One, um, mm -hmm. you've touched on, you've touched on something when it, when it came to class design that, uh, that, um, I've got, I've gotten I've gotten on people's cases about for many years, because um, mm -hmm. for the longest time I've heard this line that, and this isn't a addition wars thing. I heard I heard this when I started, and I hear I hear it now, that you can run D you can use D and D to run any kind of fantasy game. Um, and I used to think that before I got smarter about it. <laughs> um, but there are there are some people who will argue who will argue that who will argue that's the case, and I say, okay. You really, you really want to play. You really want to play this. Let's play this. <laughs> so, <laughs> the most, the most common, this, this is the test that I give them to to see to see how well, because I figure, I give them this test because I want to I want to see how how much how much they're willing to defend that argument. Mm -hmm. Um. The most common way to equip a fighter, is sword and board. Long sword, yep. or sometimes bastard sword, and a large shield. Yep. Now, how are you going to do that in a culture that doesn't use shields? Like, say, yeah. feudal Japan. Or, to a certain extent, India. Yep. They and, have trouble defending that, don't they? Um, the argument... The, the argument is that is that you is is re, is some sort of reflavoring, which is a, which is lipstick on a pig, as far as I'm concerned, or <laughs> or you have or you have the really really stupid thing like that whole like that whole samurai can just be re, can just be reskinned paladins stupidity oh. that was in the DM's guide for five e, and I have and, never let anyone forget that. And you know. I absolutely agree with you. And again, this is why I started designing my own system. But I was, I was one of those people that got really excited about reskins, about doing adaptations, saying, oh, well, you can use the D&D system for any type of storytelling. And I, I had tried. I had tried to create adventures, uh, one shots and, and stat blocks and things for even non-fantasy genres. Tried to do a horror uh, type of thing. It was still fantasy, though. It was a horror fantasy. Tried to do a sci-fi type of thing. Um, Magipunk even doesn't really work. And it got to the point where I did have that revelation kind of moment where I looked at what I was developing. And when you reskin something often enough where it becomes unrecognizable from the original system, are you really still playing that system? No. No, you're not. And I, I do think that you can separate the system from the genre in some cases. Because if you break down D&D &D to the system itself, you're looking at the structure of classes, you're looking at the D20 base, you're looking at using the range of dice for, for certain things. But when there are so many uh, genre-coded elements baked into those mechanics, you, you can't. You can't apply it to any... You can apply it to many different styles of storytelling, maybe, but when it comes to setting and genre, that's where uh, that's where I I I gave up. Yeah, I, I couldn't I couldn't follow that line anymore. Personally, I look at this as more of a reflection of how 
narrow some people's view of um, fantasy is. Because I think it's because we have a lack of really good fantasy content out there um, these days. I th- I don't I don't think it's a matter of I don't think it's a matter of qu- of quality of content, but more uh, but um, to use uh, an example of what I maybe mean, maybe variety. Variety, I'd say, would be would, is more on the mark because I remember yeah. I remember growing up and people legitimately arguing that Planescape. One of the one of the best um, <laughs> one of the be- one of the best campaign set one of the best campaign settings and one of my favorite um, CRPGs Heck yeah, of all time. Yeah, um, is was quote too weird for fantasy. And no. Then and then there's something like Numenera where the whole point is taking the idea of Clark's law and and going to its furthest logical extreme to the point where. It is impossible to tell where the where the line between sci-fi and fantasy is in that setting, and that's kind of the point. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's there's a term that I've used called the Tolkien melting pot for mm-hmm. that for that pastiche of of that pastiche mix of of Tolkien and what people think of Tolkien, and I I don't have anything against um, Tolkien's work, but there seems to be this idea that that's what you have to do in order for it to be fantasy, and that <laughs> is what I resent. There are so many subgenres within fantasy. I am. Um, yeah, it's big, seeing Tolkien as the end all be all. Sorry, go ahead. I'm a big fan of Liam Hearn's work, um, who who wrote the Tales of the Otori, and a lot of a lot of that was th- was through her um, was inspired by her experiences living out in the. Japanese countryside and living in Kyoto. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's a fantastic example. So looking at historical fantasy, mm-hmm. and and at the end of the day, fantasy is speculative. Yeah, it's speculative fiction, and yes, we can talk about where that line blurs, where that Venn diagram overlaps between fantasy and sci-fi and sci fantasy. <laughs> the further you <laughs> like go, Star the further Wars. you go back into um into science fiction history the blurrier that line gets absolutely um, especially when you're dealing with the especially when you're dealing with the pulp stuff um and there's all and i should also i should also note that uh one of my fi- one of my favorite rpgs is legend of the five rings and for okay. over 20 years i've heard people make the line about how it's how it's not how it doesn't depict real samurai which is technically true, but here's the fine print with that. They never inten- they never intended for this to be some sort of historical fiction. It doesn't take place in feudal Japan. It takes place in Rokugan. Which is a its completely own... fictional setting. Yeah. With its yeah. with its with its own pasti- with its own pastiche of ideas and a lot of it being b- being built on on the rom- on the romantic ideal the same way a lot of tales of chivalry are based on the romantic ideal of the, the romantic night. ideal oh man i i had uh <laughs> yeah I, I had some interesting uh deep dives into chivalry last week about someone bringing up the idea of chivalry as if it were a historic long-held tradition instead of something that was romanticized through literature that was not actually even written by knights and that this quote-unquote code of chivalry was an effort to more control the uh, very, very violent and unchivalrous acts of the hired muscle knights uh, during, during what was it, the 10th and 11th centuries and onward, um, because they realized, oh, oh, the, these knights that we're hiring are not so effective when they're uh, attacking, raping, pillaging, doing all these things that the church does not approve of. Yeah. So yeah, the code of chivalry and and looking at the romanticized ideals for things, and we can talk about cultural sensitivity and cultural representation. Uh, maybe that'll be a different conversation one day. Um, uh, but a- yeah, when you when you have a fictional setting and it's very clear that it's not meant to be historical fiction you can have so many different types of 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 fantasy you can have the historical fantasy you can have a dark fantasy sword and sorcery you've got um low magic high magic settings Uh, yeah it's it's very 
mm, disappointing when people tend to just sort of smoosh it all together into one. And I, I do like to think the best of people until proven otherwise. Uh, or until they give me a reason to think otherwise, I should say. Mm -hmm. And I, I hope that it's more a case of maybe just a lack of exposure. Yeah. Um, maybe they just have not seen enough different types of fantasy. And the um, media landscape within TTRPGs could do better with that kind of representation as well, to be honest. Yeah, although I, I, will, I will state that um, in, or, in order for... I think th I think that in I think that in I think that in that re in that regard, um, mm. it's it's this is this isn't something that's going that it that is going that is going to be a that is going to be a quick fix, but not at all. I um I do th I do think I do think that with the with the massive popularity of of anime, while some pe while some people mm -hmm. try and shift away from that. Try and shift away from that. I have gone in the opposite route. Nice. Uh, because, well, for, first off, there's a amazing um, five E hack for for things like Naruto that I've been able to take advantage of. Nice. When I, and to, which is, and when I say when I say hack, it's not a case of just reskinning a few things. They blew the whole thing up and overhauled everything. So it's not five E anymore. <laughs> it's still using it's still using proficiency. It's still using the D twenty system. It's still using skills, but ev uh, but it's... everything after everything okay. after that, <laughs> okay, is just is just completely overhauled. Um, okay. But one thing I did want to ask: you've referred to this as a setting agnostic. Yes. But what I find kind of interesting with that is that you sh is that I'm tr is that um. Do you consider do you consider um, Bard RPG to be a universalist game, or not, or is that not exactly the case? So it depends on what you mean by universalist. So um, yes, sitting agnostic, for, genre agnostic. Go ahead. For for the sake of clarity, games mm -hmm. that are referred to as universalist games would be things like the aforementioned Whipping Boy, GURPS, the Hero right. System. Um, um, gen um, Genesis, spelled spelled with a y, spelled with a y, um, mm. Byte, um, Amber. These are what I would. These are a few examples of what I would consider universalist games. Mm. Um. So, I think that because from what I've seen and from what I understand. Um, proponents of GURPS will say that this is the only system you need, period, right? That's something that you mentioned before. And and they'll try to say, well, any kind of game, any kind of story you want to tell, you can use this. Not so much with Bard RPG. I will say it is setting neutral, setting and genre agnostic, but there is a, a specific kind of play style that is encouraged by this system. So I, I would not call it universalist as a system, I would call it uh, genre or setting neutral, so that you can apply this to fantasy, sci-fi, horror, even superhero. During a, a previous interview and conversation I had about the system, we broke down how this could be used for a superhero type of game. Uh, that was actually a, a very fun um, exercise as well. So there's that. And it is very flexible in terms of uh, how you represent those different genres. So if you look at fantasy being speculative and fantastical, you have magic, that's fine. That, that kind of setting works with Bard RPG. If you look at Western and you have that idea of um, outlaws and wild west, rough around the edges, rebellion, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, then yes, you can tell that kind of story. But if you're looking for something that's very combat heavy, if you're looking for something that is specifically coded for a certain type of play style, like you're not, you're not going to get a Warhammer 40k experience out of Bard RPG. No. Because Warhammer 40k already exists. 
Why would I create something to take the place of another system that already exists and does what it's meant to do very well? It's not the like thing you're I wanted... for choice with Warhammer 40k. <laughs> right? I'm a pl- I've, I've been a player in a couple of those games, and we actually just did our session zero a few weeks ago. I'm really excited to get to get going. But so not a forever GM, I suppose. I am. I do get to actually play sometimes. But when it comes to Bard RPG, I wanted to focus on, again, that aspect of reflection, of shared storytelling. So it does have a GM-less option as well when it comes to the story maps, more of a rotating narrator kind of approach. Um, I wanted to look at that mindful action and focus on um, growing as a team and having some more of that balance through the archetypes, through the way you can use those archetypes. But if, if that's not the kind of play style that you want, again, system being separated from genre and setting in this case, then yeah, there are, there are other systems out there. I'm not gonna claim Bard RPG as universalist. Mm-hmm. And that that is a very good distinction to make. Cause I've t- I've I know what I know what's I know what sounds like I get, I um spend too much I spend too much time picking on folks, but I do but I do <laughs> I do so, I do think I do think that so, that certain certain conventions or un, or under or understood truths are only un, are only that way because everyone's um a, everyone's agreed to it without contesting it. Right. And that that and as I mentioned before, nothing is above reproach. Of course not. Uh, but I but whenever whenever somebody I've had I've had it asked in the past because of the fact that I call out um D and um certain adherents of D of D and D as say, as saying that it's as saying that it's a great and en- saying that's a great entry level. Um that's not all that's not always going to be the case and I and I whenever right. I've done reviews I've always used the analogy of a tailor. Mm-hmm. With, and by th- by that by that saying, I'm not saying that this. I'm not. I never say that a game is going to be for everyone. But here's the people who it who it might be a good fit for. Um, uh, I love Adventure Conqueror King system to death, but mm-hmm. I'm not gonna. But I'm only gonna be bringing that up to a certain crowd. Right. And that crowd is not going to be everyone. Conversely, right. um, if somebody has if somebody has a background with th- with be- with being a f- with being a fan of certain anime, I'm not mm-hmm. going to put them in front of D. I'm not going to put them in front of D and D. I'm probably going to put them in right. fr- in front of be- in front of Besom or something that is going to lean into what they're already familiar with. Mm-hmm. Um, you want to be mindful of your audience, mm-hmm. and and that's something that you need to determine early on. Who are you writing this game for? What is the desired play style? And if you put yourself in the player's shoes, which sometimes, and I'll say collectively, GMs, game designers, we need to be reminded of that because we get so excited and we are passionate about the hobby. We are fans of the hobby that we are trying to contribute to as creators, as designers. But you have to remember the player experience when you're doing these things. How is it going to be received? Is it going to fulfill the expectation that you yourself set from from the front uh from the front end and it, it like the hallway thing things might sound real cool but if it doesn't support those goals and it doesn't make sense for the audience you're aiming for then you need to readjust and you need to reconsider Mm-hmm. Um, what what you want to include in this system, or else it'll just become this strange patchwork of things that, sp- in, in smaller bits, you know, oh, this could look cool, this could look cool, but it doesn't really mesh. And I really wanted Bard RPG to be streamlined. And and when something you said earlier about D and D being a good entry level game, it depends. Yeah, it was a good entry level game for me because I was already familiar with storytelling and role playing games from from CRPGs. But from my experience working with brand new players who do not have 
much of a gaming background or young players, I had to I had to shift things around a lot to the point where I designed a completely new character sheet as well that was more kid friendly. Mm-hmm. That was very streamlined, easy to use, visually clean. And the way, even 5e, because people will still say it's a very good intro system, the 5th edition Player's Handbook and DM's Guide assume, with the way it's written, assume that you're already familiar with the game. It's not really written, unfortunately, in a way where someone who's brand new can just pick it up and go, okay, yeah, I get it, let's play. Mm. You kind of need someone to introduce you to it. Or watch content, watch different uh, samples uh, on the internet or, or TV or whatever to kind of show you how it could be played. Yeah, and if it if some if something is supposed to be a, a good for entry levels, it shouldn't require an asterisk. No, yeah, without caveats. Absolutely. Shouldn't require an asterisk. Shouldn't require fi- shouldn't require fine print, um, and sh- and shouldn't re- shouldn't rely on assumptions, because um, mm-hmm. you know what they say about assumptions. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> now, with with that in mind, give even the even though there's <clears throat> a a um. A heavy leaning towards, um, ne- towards narrative. I, I get the feeling you wouldn't consider, um, Bard RPG to be a story game. No, because you still have actions that need to be taken. Mm-hmm. You're not necessarily. So, dread. I love dread. I've already established that in this conversation. However, within dread you tend to be more on the reactive side versus proactive. That, to me, is an example of plot-driven storytelling versus character-driven storytelling. With Bard RPG, the story does not, cannot progress without player action. So it is very much on the line of character-driven. So you have different challenges that you're going to face. Uh, That could be uh, an encounter, a puzzle, an obstacle, or an investigation, and of course, counters being social or combat. It's not to say that this is a combat-free game. There's a, there absolutely can be combat. Uh, obstacles could be physical challenges or escaping danger. Uh, you could have, if you're playing in person, you can have the integration of hands-on, tactile kind of things for the puzzles and brain teasers, and then investigations, of course, you're solving a mystery, searching for clues. and. In order to overcome each of those challenges, you have to take an action. So that those actions that you're able to take, your strengths and weaknesses in them are going to be determined by your ability sub-archetype. So if you're familiar with Myers-Briggs uh, personality stacks, mm-hmm. we have an action stack within Bard RPG. So depending on your ability sub-archetype, sage, explorer, caregiver, jester, inventor, whatever you end up choosing, that will determine your primary, secondary, tertiary, and inferior. Mm-hmm. So you'll roll anywhere from 5d6 down to 2d6, depending on where that action domain is in your stack. And, oh, by the way, another way to make it more streamlined, we don't have huge lists of spells and Thank skills. You have to memorize Lord. and reference and have spell cards, even though I loved spell cards, and using those for the kids was really good for D&D. For this, everyone has access to the same four domains, physical, tech, supernatural, uh, and social. Mm-hmm. Called it supernatural instead of magic because magic was too fantasy coded. So that, looking that, at that, mm-hmm. go ahead. That and um, there, are cer- there, are certain, there are certain stories that, that could have something that could be considered magic adjacent but aren't magic in what people Certainly. think. Certainly. Because, Absolutely. The word, because the word magic or magician, that's going to I think a lot of people are gonna th- are gonna think of the wizard in the dusty old tower, or mm-hmm. or, or the or some or something to that extent. When if you're trying to be genre agnostic, you can't really do that. 
Oh. You can't. And, yeah. and we do have a magician ability subarchetype, but the ability subarchetypes are more about the approach you use to shape and influence the world around you, how you try to manipulate the progression of plot. So for magician, it's about the action of transforming the world around you mm. with different uh, actions that extend beyond just physical strength. Explorer, you're using your physical prowess and survival skills, you're a daring adventurer. Caregiver, you're using different things at your, your disposal to heal and protect others. So it's about more, it's more about the way in which you act and the intent behind those actions, how you manipulate things. So you have the why and the will subarchetype and the how with the ability subarchetype, but it's not, magician is not necessarily, you use magic. It's about transformation. It's about digging a little bit deeper. And that is why I wanted to pull from those Jungian archetypes mm -hmm. because those are spread across genres in that way. Yeah. Now, with with that in mind, I'd like to talk a bit about the core about the core dice mechanic because mm -hmm. being being a d6 pool can still lead can still lead to a bunch of different possibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I think I think the first thing that I need to figure out is is this a sum based system or is this a success based system? This is a sum based system. You're still going to have some basic math in this and the sum of your role will help you determine whether or not you can overcome the the different challenge and you've got different tiers of challenges tier one being the easiest most people can achieve it without much difficulty all the way up to tier five where you must have a mastery of your actions to achieve this challenge and i wanted to give those little descriptions to illustrate a little bit better how you might assign different tiers to the challenges. So when it comes to rolling your d6s, you, you roll based on your action stack, but there are different ways you can add to that. So instead of modifiers, you add another d6. So if you uh, are able to use plot points, for example, plot points are an expendable communal resource which are earned over the course of the story and they can be awarded for different events mostly linked to engaging with the plot um generating bonds discovering story threads and having like narratively effective use of your actions a plot point you can then pull from that collective pool which of course everyone has to agree to because it is a communal resource. So you have more of that collaboration and collective problem solving there. Mm -hmm. And you can add another D6 or two D6 to your role within that action stack. Um, and then when it comes to dice pools, this one's fun. So another thing that I learned through working with kids that everyone, no matter what age you are, gets a certain feeling of excitement when you get to roll all the dice lots and lots of dice kids especially loved that feeling and it's such a good sound as well um so if you have enough plot points you can invoke collectively a plot twist and these are pulled from the actual literary plot twist so you have flashbacks you have you catastrophe or reversing an event you have peripatia which is reversing a condition you can have deus ex machina and that will be um if they don't want to invoke a specific kind of plot twist, there can be a random table, a roll table for that to determine what, what they end up getting. Uh, so you have that as an option as well, but within plot twists, using the plot points, and then yes, the sum based D6 mechanic for your action stack, that's how you kind of gamify things a little bit more. If that answers your question, I may have gone down a rabbit, a rabbit <laughs> hole. I like to ramble. Yeah, I get really excited about this stuff. <laughs> as you should. I'd be, I'd be concerned if you didn't. <laughs> but just for the sake of clarity, what I, what I tend mm. to mean with um, sum-based or success-based is in a sum-based approach, you're, ro you're rolling and, and then using the sum, 
sum of what of what you rolled and comparing that to a diff to a target difficulty. Mm -hmm. A success based you're looking for a die that hit that hit over over or under a certain threshold. Um, right. An example of the former would be the roll and keep system that's used in L5R and 7C. Mm -hmm. An example of the latter would be stuff like World of Darkness and right. Shadowrun. Right. And yes, this is some based. Mm -hmm. Which is definitely interesting. A lot of a lot of D6 games that I've that I've come across tend to not take that approach. They tend to mm -hmm. they tend to take more of the more of the approach with um with with that you that you see in in that in that success based approach. Mm -hmm. And to a certain degree I can I can kind of I can kind of understand it. It's it's certainly a little less math intensive to to go, to go I roll I roll 5d6 and I'm looking for how many how many above 4 that I rolled. Right. It does make for it is very smooth, it is very streamlined to do it that way. Um, and I did consider making it success based versus having some based. And I still wanted to have a little bit of that. Still wanted to have a little bit of that math. And I also wanted to provide the opportunity to have a range of success. Mm -hmm. So within your tiers, you have a range. So if you fall within that range, like tier three, if you roll between 13 and 18, you've, you've succeeded that. But then you have more of that narrative flexibility to determine, did you blow it out of the water or did you just make it? I wanted to have more of that as an option as well. And then I don't know if you'd consider this um, kind of an introduction, an integration of some of that success-based uh, approach as well. But when it comes to very complex challenges in which there are multiple stages, multiple steps that need to be taken to achieve that goal, that could be a boss fight, that could be Indiana Jones style escaping from, from the temple kind of thing, but we use a story wheel. It's a little bit like clocks where you have different sections of that wheel that can progress. But the thing that's different with the story wheel is that with each success you have based on you know succeeding at the tier for whatever that step of the challenge is, it can turn forward or backwards, mm -hmm. depending on how you play things or by inaction. Yeah. Which goes back to that concept of plot progression being character driven. And. I know you said I know you said that you're not that you're not doing a long ass spell list, which I am gr which I am grateful for as <laughs> oh, some glad. as somebody who did a whole experiment to see how bad spell bloat could get. Mm -hmm. um, it was basically me going through a bunch of games and seeing how many ba how many pages total and how many pages just for spells. Um, mm -hmm. Pathfinder was the worst offender. Oh, I believe that. Um, yeah. And the and um, well, it was, it's a it's a tie between Pathfinder and D and D and D third, oh, specifically three point five. And what I find funny about that, of course, is when I when I asked someone who when I asked someone involved about why prestige classes weren't in the core books where you think they should be, and instead instead the first one is in the DM's guide. The reason I was given was that they ran out of room. And without missing a beat, I said, oh, maybe, no. maybe you'd have some room if you left a, if if you um, left if you left a few pages for for it instead of having an ass load of spells. But <laughs> one other one other thing that can cause the bloat issue is, in general, a long skill list. That's one of the things I keep picking on Shadowrun about. Mm -hmm. And in particular, knowledge skills. So I'm cu I'm curious. Mm. Based on what I saw of the character sheet, it looked like it looked like the concept of a skill list, as is typically known, isn't the case here. Correct. So I'm ge I'm guessing that I'm guessing that bullet was do was dodged. Yes, purposefully. Mm -hmm. And I I'd thought about having different skills and specific defined actions that you can take. The only actions that are actually defined are 
special actions that are connected to your will subarchetype. So each player will have a specific kind of special action that's like a, a super powered move that they can use once per chapter that ends up being different and more archetype uh, inspired compared to the four action domains. But when it comes to those other actions, the big lists, <clears throat> there is a reference action wheel that will give examples of different things that you can do within physical, supernatural, social, and tech. However, it's not all inclusive. And when it comes to prepping for different types of genres, this is the only thing that should change and should be modified or adapted depending on your genre. Because you might have something that's more steampunk, cyberpunk. So you can integrate that within your kind of reference list. But I wanted to provide some examples. So social, you can, you can have negotiation, interrogation, observing, deceiving, appealing. Supernatural, you might have things like illusion, um, he, uh, augmentation, divination, things like that. Physical, that one's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Then tech is mostly crafting based whatever that technology within that genre would end up being that is not the same as supernatural yeah so i wanted to provide parameters and examples to mm -hmm. get players thinking about it but leave it open enough where you can if it makes sense for the story and someone has a really cool idea the whole rule of cool thing that you can integrate it yeah. And one question has been brought up before, specifically when it comes to weapons. Like, well, how do weapons work in this game? You don't really have stats for weapons, like a, a gun versus a sword. My answer to that was, well, it depends on how you operate that weapon. Is it like a laser gun? Is it something more tech-based? Is it something that you need to have physical strength for? Well, that's, that's how you use it. And using the action domains as your way of operating said weapon, spell, tool, whatever it is, that should be the thing that helps to balance it out based on your primary, secondary, tertiary, inferior. Um, or if you do find a tool and it's a tool that is, is purpose built for a certain thing, maybe having that and using that will lower the tier for the challenge. Yeah. So that's how I'm trying to balance having that encouragement of creativity and imagination mm -hmm. with some parameters and with some balance built yeah. in. Now, so how appro for this next thing, how appropriate that I'm asking this on July f on July 4th? Because <laughs> when it comes to the system, I want to do a bit of grilling. Okay. <laughs> so I'd like to go through a few concepts. Okay. And how and how you might interpret these concepts within within that system. Okay. So I'll start with something relatively simple, and let's go with a good let's go with a good old hacker in a, in a cyberpunk setting. Um, Excellent. The idea the idea of of pl of plugging in plugging into a si plugging into a system and go, and um go and going in and trying to cr trying to crack open. Um, so trying to crack open security and that the t the typical affair the mm -hmm. um how would you inter how would you interpret that particular kind that particular kind of archetype of the cyberpunk style hacker um whether whether it's a net runner or a de or a decker that's in that's inconsequential um in mm -hmm. in this system so for this there would be two things i'd be looking at first would be to define the type of challenge this hacking would present. The first thing that comes to mind for me is a puzzle or a brain teaser. Mm -hmm. So there is room in this game for introducing kind of mini game types of puzzles. So something that I do have planned for a hacking type of event actually in our Outpost 5 campaign in the finale, no spoilers. I think some of them have already anticipated this, but I'm going to have different examples of number and word puzzles mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. for them to unscramble in real time to represent the act of hacking the code. Mm-hmm. And that could be similar to lock picking. If you wanted to introduce something like that, it could also be investigation searching for clues. So I'd want to really define what what type of challenge category it would be and then help to determine what action would be appropriate for it. So of course, the first thing that comes to mind for a hacker is that would be tech. Mm-hmm. That would be tech know-how. That would be knowledge of a technical system. So if you would have the puzzle or if you would have a role for it would depend on the kind of challenge being done. If you wanted to have a role to determine how quickly you could get something done, if you didn't have that kind of puzzle aspect that you wanted to introduce, then you would roll your tech domain. And depending on the archetype, um, if someone wanted to create a hacker specifically, I would probably recommend Ooh, I, I would actually recommend two one of two uh, ability subarchetypes. You could go with the magician with that transformative approach. Or you could go with sage, in which you manipulate patterns around you in both the physical and mental sense. I think you could take either of those approaches. Um, I would probably pick magician over sage because that gives you a higher tech proficiency within your action stack. Uh, Or you could go inventor, which has tech in the primary, bringing new ideas to fruition by creating new tools, inventions, and works of art. So that is how I would look at creating that kind of encounter, Mm. if if that makes sense. For the next, for the next one, um, I'd like I like to I like to revisit an, an old an old favorite an old favorite of mine, especially as somebody who has has developed a growing appreciation for Wuxia over and uh, and Tiansha over the over the last few years. Mm-hmm. Um, let's t- let's t- let's um. Let's delve into the concept of somebody who wanted to be a master of drunken fist. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. The sim- the simple idea of the the um somebody who they're a proficient martial artist on the, on their own, but they get mm-hmm. they get better and better the drunker they are. Mm-hmm. And if you see if you've seen and if you've seen any move any martial arts film that has drunken fist, you know exactly. Oh how yeah. How much of a how much of a pest that style can get? Oh yeah, oh it's hilarious though. I have to say it's one of my favorite mm-hmm. <laughs> characterizations when it comes up, just because you have that balance of comedy but badassery at the same time. Oh, mm-hmm. I love it. I love it so much. Okay, so are we talking about within combat how this may come into play? Uh, I would I would say I would say yeah I would say. Yes, but I get the feeling you have some ideas outside of combat. So, another, th- I'll answer with the combat one first, mm-hmm. and then the way in which we uh, capture progression and advancement of skills second. So, with combat first, typically, if someone is intoxicated, depending on the character, if they were a non-master of Drunken Fist, for example, I would consider that a a mark of burden, something that would actively act against them, which increases in this case. Uh, if someone were drunk and getting into a bar fight and they can't handle their liquor, the actions that would be impacted by that specifically, uh, we'll say physical in this sense, mm-hmm. it will be harder for them to achieve their goal. So their tier for that challenge may increase by nature of the circumstance. However, for uh, Master of the Drunken Fist, that would not be the case. So I would say that your tier would actually lower the more <laughs> you drink. That's one way we could approach that one. Yeah. Um, and I may even, depending on how narratively it's presented and how the player is getting into it, I may even award plot points for it because it would be in line with their archetype and yep. they'd be leaning into that characterization joining together the combat with the role play 
which would provide even more power to them if they're if they want to use a plot point if that's something that the party decides they want to do so if that answers your the combat aspect of things i can then move on to the progression aspect yeah okay so when it comes to progressing when it comes to actively training and improving your skills the way we do that is by keeping track of the way you use your actions the way you use each action domain throughout the course of a, a chapter in this case whether it's um, a one shot or a long running campaign and at the end of each chapter we have a built-in reflection period where you take stock of the plot points that you've earned the bonds that you've discovered or strengthened story threads you've discovered and um how you've really leaned into accomplishing wishes, things like that, uh, inspired by Dungeon World in that one. So those plot points can be used to level up. They can be used to improve an action domain, or they can be used also to evolve a special action that's tied to that will sub archetype. So if we wanted to look at action domain, I would say that over time, if you're continuing to use physical actions, you could increase that 4d6, 3d6 to a 5d6. Yeah. If you are showing that you are consciously, deliberately trying to improve that skill. Uh, if it's a special action, let's say for a drunken, for a master of the drunken fist, I would look at the rebel will archetype transgressor and provocateur who likes going against the grain challenges status quo but can sometimes be self-destructive so again will archetypes looking at the ideals and wishes that motivate your actions the why behind your character special actions related to that can be provoke or sabotage i think that there would be a very nice evolution of that special action within the rebel sub archetype that could fit very nicely with uh, a drunken master becoming more masterful. And that's cer that's certainly something I can see. And if if somebody wanted to really stretch it, um, use that use that to use that to say that the antics have pissed off the Im the immortals. Mm hmm. Uh -huh. If, if only be, if only because it really fit, it really fits within the, within that <laughs> setup. Absolutely, and if your opponent's pissed off, they're going to make stupid decisions. Yeah, they're going to reveal their own weaknesses and vulnerabilities in the way they may not intend to. I think so. You can absolutely take advantage of that. I think it's a there's a quote that's attributed to Napoleon that I, al I always reference in these kind of situations: "Never interrupt your enemy when he is making a mistake." Yes. Oh, that's a fantastic one. Oh. Yeah. Now, so does that does that work with the drunken yeah. master? Yeah, I'd okay. say I'd say that it does, and there's pl there's plenty there's plenty of 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 varieties of of drunken fighting. There's mm -hmm. I remember I remember making I remember making a brewmaster class for a, um not for not for D and D but for something D and D adjacent. I believe it was fantasy craft that I did it. I made it a um a expert class. Um, nice. And fantasy craft is this is a story in and of itself, but the and the the whole idea was we have an entire we have an entire race that that does that is dedicated to drinking to the point where brewing brewery um, recipes are something worth fighting over. Mm -hmm. Why are we not Why are we not using this to do to do drunken martial arts? <laughs> oh, maybe uh, uh, almost an avatar-esque approach where you have different styles of fighting based on the type of beer that's being brewed. That was that was actually what I that was actually what I Yes! Oh, um, I love it. Yes. Like <laughs> your st like your sta your your sta your standard beer was 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 more of a was more of a bare was more of a bare knuckle boxer approach. Um mm -hmm. not all not all that ref not all that refined um and is bit and instead is built more for those who like to block with their face because <laughs> blocking with the face very good 
Bas basically, basically, much like much like a tankard of bad ale, you don't go down easy in that in that style. You're meant you're meant to. You're meant <laughs> is that to flavor text? <laughs> that sounds like it should be flavor text. <laughs> it is. It is to it is to a point. Um, I think that there there was one that ha there was one that leaned that leaned far more into, um, into into mu into Muay Thai of. Of um, just of just of just sudden hit of just sudden hits, because I've always I've always liked Muay Thai as a um setup. Um, I think there was I think there was one other that leaned far much into Sambo. If you're familiar with that acronym. Mm-hmm. Yep. So which which style of beer was paired with Sambo? Um, I. I think if I recall if I recall correctly. Um, vodka? Yeah, yeah, it was it was vodka. I I was doing a kind yes. of dr kind of On drinks or, kind of drinks around the world. Um, I did have it that one that because of the fact that I like to pick on wine drinkers, I I had it that I had it that wine was built was built more on um on Bagua Zhang. Oh. Bagua Zhang. Okay. Okay. You know, um, some, something a bit, something a bit more, something a bit more fluid. I wanted, I wanted to be, I wanted it to be built on, on, um, on crane style kung fu, but my, but my writing partner at the time was like, no. Um, <laughs> and for the record, Sambo is a, is an, a, is a acronym. It's the Soviet. Uh huh. It's Soviet. It's a Russian. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not gonna try and I'm not gonna try and pronounce what it what it's supposed to what it's supposed to be an acronym for, but it translates to um, self defense without weapons. Yep. Um, and even when even when it comes to weapons, I always try and encourage people to think outside the box. Um, and and look at and look at weapons for, look at weapons from different from different cultures instead of just instead of going with a long sword why. Why not go? Why not go with? Why not go with a um with a gaunt, with a gauntlet sword because those were a thing. Um, just that just as just as one ex just as one example. Um, or instead in instead of instead of going with instead of going with a long sword, why not go with a why not go with a falchion and. Mm -hmm. The um, I want to see some escrima sticks out there. My family is Filipino American, yeah, so I've, I am a big fan of of Kali. Yeah, I've <laughs> I've, di I've dipped in I've dipped into that I've dipped into that particular style with some with some builds. I've di I've um I had I had one character who used a sunset cone. Mm, okay. Um, bas basically, the three section staff. Um, yeah. And I've um I think I and I um I did have even when it even when it comes to more cyberpunky st stuff I because I was playing a troll I talked my GM into letting me letting me utilize let me utilize bigger weapons because the mindset is if he's that if he's that big why is he using weapons meant for smaller hands? It doesn't matter what genre it is. Your your character should always be using, ideally, always be using tools that are fit for that character. Uh, so and I yeah. I said I got I got a dumb idea that he that he um he f he found the blueprint for the fat Mac and and modded it so that it's semi auto. Oh my god! Which <laughs> if you've seen what the fat Mac looks like, you'll know why that is. Yes, why that is, yes. that is preposterous, <laughs> and I love that you worked that in. Because um. <laughs> I would get, I um, in in some campaigns I would give my I would give my players stuff like the noisy cricket, you know, extremely powerful but extremely unwieldy and dangerous weapons, for both the enemy and the user. <laughs> I think it looks more like a flea myself, but. <laughs> well, I don't I don't think it matters much when you're when, no. when you're getting knocked back twenty yards flat on your ass. Not at all. <laughs> but, um. The third, the third archetype that I kind of wanted to go into, and this is more of Ooh, exploring yes. the idea of reputation, and Ooh, specifically okay. infamy, is um, now to, now to put this in a bit of context, 
I am a big fan of puro resu, Japanese pro wrestling. Mm -hmm. I will, I and especially especially stuff especially stuff coming out of um, New Japan and pro wrestling Noah. And there's been some times where I've used where I've put in and where I've put in a legendary, a a um NPC who's an XP of a legendary wrestler the same way, um the Boulder was basically an XP for the Rock in Avatar. Um, <laughs> there we go. Nice. But. One, but one particular that I use, who it, who is probably the probably the scariest man in rest in wrestling, is doing is having a combat instructor who's an XP of Minoru Suzuki. <laughs> okay. Uh, and the reason why I have to bring that bring that up in context is because when I when I say that he's the when I say that he's the scariest man in wrestling, I'm not just talking about. That that in a in universe thing. Even the people in the locker room tend to give him some distance. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's not he it's, is known. He is he is no. He he was trained by the Gotch family, which is as old school as you can get. And the thing the thing is is that he is that he he found he founded one of the first MMA organizations in Pancras and. Is well known for his well known for his ability to f to find ways to bend you in ways you shouldn't, and ma and make and make even pros scream about it. Ah, so an artist. <laughs> <laughs> I love the idea of using an artist sub archetype for this. I I truly do. <laughs> yeah, and whenever he's come out, people um, sometimes I hear the announcers go, "Don't make eye contact." <laughs> <laughs> oh, and when um when when Cyrus was on commentary for for New Japan, anytime he'd show up, he'd ju he'd jump right in, he'd jump right into the back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was like, "I know that if he gets his hands on me, he's gonna do something to benefit him, and they are not paying me enough to get to get stretched by him." <laughs> but the survival reason, instinct. Yeah, but the reason I bring that up is is how you would handle some a how you would handle. A character with that level of infamy, where people when just mm -hmm. he doesn't even have to do anything; just his just his or her presence is enough to give people pause. So I think that because you you absolutely can build reputation in this game, mm -hmm. you can build reputation, and it will determine uh, how NPCs, how the environment around you reacts to your presence, reacts to your actions. So you could use that reputation piece because in any kind of storytelling, when you have your protagonists, eventually, if it's any sort of, uh, especially if it's any sort of hero's journey, you're going to gain a reputation. You're going to gain some sort of renown, whether it's positive or negative mm -hmm. over time. However, there's also an aspect and, and you might see it on the character sheet as well. There's an as aspect of bonds of connections that you have to specific characters or organizations mm -hmm. that you can leverage. Now a bond can be positive or negative. Mm -hmm. That could be a negative connection with a certain group of people and that will uh, impact how you interact in areas where those group of people either exist or they are known. Or that could be uh, a positive interaction, a positive connection, um, and, and work in in the reverse kind of way. So I would I would end up leaning into a combination of reputation that comes along with the role playing, and how successful you are in reinforcing that perception, that kind of fearful presence, that aura that you develop over time. In this case, I would end up leaning into that as well as the bond mechanic. And if you are going to act upon this, if you're going to use it to your advantage, whenever you lean into a bond, if you invoke the bond in one of your actions, you do get to have a boosted role. Mm -hmm. Now, you had already you had already mentioned the page the page count that you had, but mm -hmm. putting a taking into a now I know this isn't I know this kind of thing is in flux, but 
Mm-hmm. What, but, um, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window for the digital version, at least? I know that I, I bring that up because I'm well, I'm well aware that, the, that, um, shipping is a bit of a shit show these days. Oh my god. Yep, I already addressed some of those questions as well. Um, there were some people on Kickstarter who were curious, we'll say, about why I could not provide more firm estimates for shipping when it comes to risks involved with production. And I, I told them, well, I, I can't really predict the uh, economic state <laughs> of things once we get to that point when it comes to supply lines. That's, that's in flux week after week. But when it comes to the PDF, I, I would aim for that to be ready. I, that, that could definitely be ready at the latest um, January 2023, if I were being very generous. Because for the most part, the system itself is done, it's written. But it's fleshing it out and presenting it as a full guidebook. Mm -hmm. uh, we're aiming for May 2023 for the printing and distribution, for, th for the book to be in people's hands, which means we're looking at the actual printing and packaging and distribution process starting as early as January or February, just to ensure that we get things out in time. You've got to give yourself a couple months of a window for these kinds of things. Um, so yeah, I, I would say probably January mm -hmm. at, at the latest, I think is, is probably feasible depending on the artwork. I, I wanted to give the creative team a flexible timeline for this because life happens and we know that from the past few years. Unexpected things will inevitably pop up over the next year, over the next six months when we're in production for this. So my goal is to have enough of that built into the anticipated and communicated timeline that we have enough of that wiggle room, we have enough of that buffer space, so that we do not bust that May 2023 goal for the physical books. But I would say that the PDF will definitely be ready to go a few months prior to that. I, I don't want to make any hard promises because you never know. <laughs> but that's what we're aiming for. And if this all goes well, if Bard RPG is a, a resounding success and people love it, I do intend to eventually release an SRD. Yeah. Because I want this to be out in the wild. I want to see what people do with it. I want to see how they adapt it and homebrew it for their own campaigns as well. I get really excited about that kind of thing because I'm proud of this system. I've been working on it for a couple of years uh, in a more focused manner. But of course, you know, ideas start long before you actually start putting pen to paper. We, I've, I've been working on this. The, the creative team has really helped with play testing and giving good feedback for it. But at the same time, I'm not going to get aggressively defensive over people playing it as written because that's not the point. Ultimately, I think storytelling is a beautiful thing and using TTRPGs as a continuation of the ancient oral storytelling practices that have been present throughout the history of humanity, it's always evolving. It's always in flux. So my hope is to create a system that continues to inspire that and helps to enable that passion. Mm -hmm. So I want people to take it and do whatever they want with it. As long as they're enjoying it, as long as it is keeping people telling stories together, then that's mission accomplished for me. Mm -hmm. Well, with all the, I will certainly be looking forward to it, but with all that thank said, you. I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. <laughs> I loved it. I'm, I'm so happy that you invited me on. This was fantastic. Thank you so much. And anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> I do have a bottle of desk bourbon. <laughs> Maybe I'll crack that open next time. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!